Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Canon Biomedical Revealing New Solutions, presented, presented by Dr. Brian McNally. We're delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots and sponsored by Canon Biomedical. Canon Biomedical, a wholly owned subsidiary of Canon USA Incorporated, is focused on empowering the biomedical research and healthcare communities by developing, manufacturing, and marketing innovative technologies and solutions. The technologies and solutions developed will help enable clinicians and scientists to improve our health and advance science. For more information, please visit www.canon-biomedical.com. I am Judy O'Rourke of Labroots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the green Q&A button located in the lower left of the presentation window and type your question into the box that appears on the screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. This is an educational webinar and thus offers free continuing education credits. After the webinar is over, and to get your credits, click on the CE button located in the bottom left-hand corner of your web page. Also, please notice that you will be viewing the presentation in the slide window. To enlarge the window, just click on the screen icon located on the lower right. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of the presentation window, or use the Q&A button to let us know that you're having a problem. Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Brian McNally. Brian has 15 years of practical experience at the laboratory bench, and his work has been published in peer-reviewed journals and presented at international conferences. In 2008, he transitioned to industry to commercialize new biomedical products, including assays, reagents, and software. Brian has been with Canon Biomedical since its inception last year. He is passionate about partnering with life scientists to develop the next wave of biomedical solutions. Please join me in welcoming Brian. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Great. Um, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, so I'm uh, really excited to be sharing at our uh, first uh, conference with uh, LabRoots, our first virtual conference is Canon Biomedical. As Judy mentioned, uh, we're a brand new uh, company. Uh, but we have a very familiar logo um, that we'll talk about in a little bit. But um, I did want to get uh, started with <clears throat> um, a couple of disclaimers and notices. Uh, one, any of the solutions that I show today are going to be uh, from Canon Biomedical or for research use only. They're not for use in diagnostic procedures. Uh, for those of you that request uh, current licensing information and product disclaimers, uh, we have product-specific user manuals and documentation on our website uh, that was mentioned at canon-biomedical.com. Uh, or it can be requested from a Canon Biomedical representative, and we'll provide that information at the end of today's talk. Uh, the products that I'll show you uh, during the course of today's presentation uh, are currently only available in the United States as of May 4th, uh, 2016. Um, that's not to say forever. That's just for today. And um, I'll go ahead and move on to the uh, agenda for today. So some of you might be wondering, I've seen that logo before, um, you know, that looks like a camera logo or a printer logo. So what is Canon doing at LabRoots? And so we'll talk a little bit about that. And then we'll talk about Canon's interest in genetics, uh, specifically human genetics. And then the most of the majority of the talk will really be focused around then how uh, individual scientists should go about selecting genotyping technologies, uh, which benefit, which particular uh, ones are advantageous for their experimental use. And we'll focus on the benefits of high resolution melting. Um, and then at the end, I'll conclude by discussing a little bit about the novel little assays and chemistries as an introduction. So Canon at LabRoot. So you might be wondering if I was going to talk about maybe cameras that are going to be hooked up to your microscope. Um, and that's not what I'm going to be talking about. So I was actually kind of curious if we could launched the first poll, I was curious, how many of you have heard of Canon Biomedical uh, previously? So, so if you just want to go ahead and click on the yes or no button, that'd be really great. Um, so uh, as was indicated during the course of the introduction, Canon Biomedical was actually founded uh, last year. Uh, in March of 2015, 
And then we launched our very first product in September of uh, 2015 and have continued to release additional products since then. Okay. So, um, so we're actually not really um, uh, offering cameras uh, or my, uh, for your microscope. In fact, though, um, Canon though does have a long history in uh, biomedical applications, and this is actually Canon's first uh, CEO, um, Mr. Uh, Dr. Mitterai. Dr. Mitterai uh, was, as you can see, a, a medical doctor. Uh, he was a um, um, gynecologist and was the first Canon president. Uh, and in 1940, you can see there pictured on the right was the first uh, indirect X-ray camera that was offered in Japan uh, that was offered by Canon. So Canon has had a long interest in biomedical applications and medical history. Some people that know, uh, for instance, the areas of ophthalmology are aware of uh, some of the products that are in ophthalmology to support uh, ophthalmologists diagnosing um, glaucoma. Um, but we're really at this point now beginning to return to our roots. And as you can see from this slide, this is now our current care, uh, chairman and CEO, uh, Mr. Mitterai, who's um, actually related to um, Dr. Mitterai. And in 2013, uh, there was an article that was published um, here in the Nikkei News uh, that Canon was going to begin making DNA testers in the United States and that medical devices would become uh, a new product area for Canon. And so in beginning to execute that, um, operation, Canon Biomedical was uh, formed last year and began to launch our very first products. And so I'd like to share with you in the uh, next slide a little bit about sort of the background of Canon's philosophy and how uh, we'd like to interact with the research marketplace, uh, for instance, those people that are coming to the Genetics and Genomics Conference. Uh, so Canon as a corporation has a philosophy uh, referred to as QSA. It's uh, symbolized here, and this roughly translates to all people, regardless of race, religion, or culture, harmoniously living and working together into the future. And if we think about that uh, statement, working together uh, into the future uh, harmoniously, we think about um, how that would, for instance, be embodied by healthcare. And isn't this uh, sort of our, you know, as a species, sort of our common goal to sort of live better lives. And I've just put some uh, gross statistics about um, what's going on in the world as far as uh, global aging uh, in the upper left-hand corner. You can see that our population overall is becoming older. We're living longer. Um, but then you can see that there are chronic diseases that are occurring, either those stemming in the uh, graph in the upper right-hand corner with increasing obesity rates globally. So each of those curves represents an individual country. Uh, and their obesity rate from starting in the year 2000 heading towards 2020. And then if we look at the graph on the second line on the left-hand side, you can see that these are overall chronic disease burdens. So this is represented by diseases such as heart failure, uh, diabetes, cancer in the United States, and the projected number of uh, incidents and new cases um, within our country. And so it is a mutual goal for us all to be living a healthier and better lives and that Canon Biomedical actively wants to contribute to improving uh, that um, lifestyle. And so we began as a company by looking at how we could help perhaps other companies that are already actively involved in improving health. Um, and I wanted to show this slide that shows two of our um, uh, partners that we work with. The one on the left there is T2 Biosystems, a company based out of Boston. Um, they work on infectious disease testing. They have a fully automated sample to answer molecular diagnostics platform uh, that received FDA clearance in 2014 for a candida fungal panel. And Canon Biomedical and P2 Biosystems are working together to co-develop a new test that is focused on Lyme disease. Subsequent to that, we also had another arrangement that um, we've been working with a small company in, out of Ontario, Canada called Spartan. Uh, they have a device that's pictured in the lower right there that's a point of need testing. It's a fully automated sample to answer genotyping platform. And it does a single test for a genetic variant that's associated <coughs> uh, with a pharmacogenetic indication. And it's uh, been approved in uh, Health Canada as a near patient testing, so you can see that. And, Canon Biomedical here is working with these other companies to provide a partner for IP strategy, core technology, development engineering, 
uh, manufacturing and technical support. And this uh, represents our ability as a corporation at large to reach out to other companies and assist in the development of their technologies and empower them to be more widespread so that it can all fundamentally improve healthcare um, within the country. But at the same time, um, we have our own interests here at Canaan Biomedical, and those focus mainly around the field of human genetics, and that's what I'm going to focus on for the rest of today's talk. Specifically, um, those genetic variations that uh, impact uh, the formation of inherited diseases, our reaction to drug medications, or um, the uh, uh, potential for uh, disease. And so genetic variations, of course, can come in a number of different forms. Uh, for instance, uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs. Somatic mutations, or so those are non-inherited mutations that are commonly associated with, for instance, cancer. Uh, examples would be in uh, mutations in uh, EGFR, BRAF, uh, that uh, would lead to, for instance, uh, breast cancer, lung cancer. Of course, the variations can be larger. They can be insertions and deletions, and this could be as small as, for instance, the insertion of a single nucleotide, creating a frame shift, or something much larger in the kilobase range that deletes an entire gene. And then, of course, we have copy number variations and alterations that are much larger changes and rearrangements uh, that are structural variations within the genome. And so when scientists begin sort of thinking about testing uh, for genetic variation, there's a, a number of research applications that are driving that need for testing. And I've just listed off a couple here just to kind of introduce conceptually that, for instance, in clinical research, there's a lot of times where there's um, pre-screening of individuals, so for prospective studies, so including or excluding uh, particular samples from the study before, for instance, spending uh, large amounts of resources, energy, time, money on, for instance, whole genome sequencing, you would perhaps want to pre-screen samples for uh, inclusion or exclusion. There could be some very functional type uh, work, for instance, uh, screening for CRISPR clone generation uh, or retrospective studies where you're going back to samples that have already been collected and then applying, for instance, a, a new genotype to that study to better understand that population. And then, of course, after large uh, genome studies, for instance, those coming off of, for instance, SNP arrays, or RACI, GH, microarray data, there's often a need to then verify that that mutation indeed was uh, present or that SNP was uh, present in a particular um, sample or set of samples. And now with uh, so many core laboratories uh, holding, for instance, the uh, next generation platforms and wanting to send those samples off, a lot of times there's a concern, and there's a number of professional organizations that have been formed around the world to ensure that samples aren't mixed up, that they indeed are reporting back the data with the original associated sample. And so sample identification can be done using just a very small number of, uh, for instance, SNPs. Uh, I've seen some papers that are range between 18 and uh, 24 SNPs to uniquely identify a sample to ensure that the rest of the genomic sequence that's been provided with that data file indeed matches the original sample that you sent off to that core laboratory. So these represent really just examples of times where you actively have to genotype a sample uh, as a uh, scientist. And so when you then have that need to, to genotype a sample, you're really then having to choose, well, what is the appropriate technology for the experiment that I have? Are you trying to discover new mutations that are uh, previously undescribed, or are you really testing for things that are known already? Do you have large numbers of samples or just a handful? Do they come in all at once? Um, do you have a biobank to pull from? Or is this a rolling study where maybe you'll only get one or two samples a week that you'd like to genotype? How much of the sample are you getting? Uh, are you getting a, you know, a nice uh, five mil blood tube, or is this a fleeting amount of sample? And then how much uh, resources are in the laboratory? Are there are a lot of people to be able to process this, analyze data. And each of these different factors goes into your choice as a scientist on what tool you want to pull out of the toolbox to analyze and genotype your samples. So asking these questions ahead of time helps you with experimental design, selecting the appropriate technology to then apply to efficiently get your answer in a cost-effective manner. So what are some of those technologies that are in your, your tool basket? And I've listed some of them here, for instance, next generation sequencing, uh, mass spectrometry, uh, Sanger sequencing, hydrolysis probe, PCR, 
uh, a high resolution melting analysis or a number of the technologies that you can pull from to genotype uh, samples currently. And I'd like to focus on high resolution melting analysis. I think many people are familiar with it. But before I start that, I'd like to launch another poll. I'd like to know how many of you are currently using uh, PCR for genotyping analysis? And so this will be our second poll. And if you could go ahead and click on just the yes or no, that'd be really uh, helpful. So I'm, I think we're still trying to get the poll up. There we go. Do you genotype by PCR? That's right. Perfect. And so if you just want to go ahead and click on yes or no, that would be great. Uh, perfect. So a lot of times this genotyping by PCR, there's a number of different methodologies that can be used. Um, and one of which that I've described was high resolution melting. Another would be, of course, hydrolysis probe. There's a number of other uh, versions uh, of genotyping by PCR uh, that include, for instance, um, molecular beacons and scorpion probes. And so that's why I wanted to ask my, site and my third poll, which is, uh, do you, have you used high resolution melting analysis previously? is I'm going to spend the next couple of slides just quickly introducing the concepts of high-resolution melting. And I just wanted to get a quick sense of the audience um, whether or not you've used high-resolution melting analysis for genotyping um, before. So I'm going to put up my third poll now. Perfect. And this is a great opportunity to just kind of understand the sophistication and you know, whether or not I should go ahead and breathe through HRM or uh, really sort of explain in a little bit more detail. So that's great. Okay, perfect. Well, I certainly appreciate everybody taking the time to answer those. Um, and so moving into um, high-resolution melting analysis, for those of you that are not familiar with this technique, uh, of course you know that as you increase temperature, DNA unwinds. Um, and so you can imagine that if there is a fluorescent molecule, a dye that uh, binds double-stranded DNA, at low temperatures uh, there would be a duplex so the dye would bind very nicely and fluoresce, but that if you raise the temperature, as shown on the x-axis here in this figure, that the Single, the DNA is going to unwind and uh, leave behind two single-stranded uh, DNA molecules, and then the dye is no longer bound, and uh, there's not a, a significant fluorescent signal. And so that um, equilibrium point where half of the DNA is um, unwound um, generates about 50% of the signal. That is your melting temperature. And so that's uh, really sort of the biochemical basis behind high-resolution melting. And then it's really a very simple PCR protocol where uh, scientists begin by doing DNA extraction. Uh, in this particular case, we strongly recommend that samples be prepared using the same protocol and reagents uh, so that there is a similar salt concentrations in the resulting DNA isolate. And then um, moving on, then you prepare a reaction mixture, much like a traditional PCR reaction, using the same amount of DNA, and then you add in a master mix, perhaps an assay, and then a little bit of water and put it into your HRM-capable uh, thermocycler to go ahead and run PCR. And at the end of the PCR protocol, there's this post-amplification melt. This post-amplification melt is an instrument um, that then uh, raises, ramps the temperature over time. Um, and this ramping over time then uh, allows you to then melt the DNA, measure the TM, and that identifies unique products that have been formed uh, during uh, the PCR uh, process. And then if there are the presence of SNPs or insertions or deletions, what ends up happening is that you can actually then distinguish those by their TM uh, differences. And so what you can see above uh, data point four there is that these different curves then represent different genotypes. So there's been a change in the DNA sequence that then melts at a different temperature. 
So why would you use this technique? What, what are the advantages inherently? And one of them, of course, is that you can do a broad selection of targets, and I'm going to spend some time showing you exactly um, the uh, breadth of the targets that you can then design assays for. Um, they're relatively fast PCR reactions overall. You can uh, do very short cycling times um, and uh, fast ramp rates so that it dec decreases the amount of the protocol time. And the data analysis is highly scalable so that you can do as few as just a single sample at a time up to very large numbers uh, quite easily in doing the data analysis. So it's a very scalable solution depending on how many samples that you're trying to use at a single time. So what are some of those use cases? And I wanted to talk about that. So when you think about all the different types of genetic and epigenetic targets, I've tried to list out all of those that you can design HRM assays against. And some of those would be, for instance, the single nucleotide polymorphisms, so SNPs, you can design those. You can also do things against somatic mutations. There's examples of insertions and deletions. Those could be um, very small, for instance, maybe six nucleotides. Um, or um, then you could also do uh, unique targets, for instance, those uh, variations that are within the mitochondria. You can do copy number measurements um, within copy number measurements. Um, there are examples of measuring the copy number for whole genes. And then finally, because of um, bisulfite conversion of uh, CPG nucleotides, you can actually look for methylated targets. And so you can even do epigenetic analysis using HRM. So a really wide range of different targets that you can employ the HRM technology against. And I'm going to show some of those to you in, um, in um, these examples. So one of them is an example of mitochondrial targets. Um, and what you can see here is um, this gene, MILAS, it's in the mitochondrial genome. Um, it's a syndrome for mitochondrial myopathy, encephalopathy, lactic acid acidosis, and a stroke-like episodes. And genetically heterogeneous um, phenotypes uh, result clinically. And what you can see here is that you can actually then distinguish this mutation that's in the mitochondrial genome um, from the wild type. And I've actually blown that up in the next slide so that you can distinguish these a little bit better. So what you see here in the, uh, the black is this is the wild type. Um, and then what you can see is that there's a variant here in the red. So this would be the homozygous mutant form of the epilocus. And then the blue, sorry, I've got this going the wrong way. Um, the blue line represents the heterozygous, where only one um, is uh, present. So a really neat example of using um, HRM assays to detect my, uh, mutations in the mitochondria. But one of the flexibilities that you can have with HRM assays is that you can actually detect a number of uh, closely um, spaced mutations. So in this particular case, this is in the FE, HFE gene. Uh, this is linked to an iron storage disorder. And I know that the figure on the right is difficult to see, so I've blown it up here so that you can actually not only see uh, one mutation, but you can actually detect the other mutation uh, here as well. And this is important because the 187 mutation from a C to a G and the 193 mutation are the two most common mutations, or two of the most common mutations in the HFA gene that lead to this um, disease. And so what you can again see, um, I'll try to point these out with the arrows, is for instance this black uh, curve here represents what would be the wild type at both positions. And then you can see in the different colors, for instance, uh, in this uh, light blue, you can see a heterozygote mutation at one position. Uh, in the green, you can see a heterozygote at another mutation. And then you can also see the homozygotes at both positions. And so this can be often very difficult to design assays against uh, when you're doing, for instance, um, hydrolysis probe design or other probe-based designs. And in this particular case, it's quite easy to do uh, because you're looking at the entire amplicon at once and then distinguishing by these melting temperatures. Now, I've seen that there um, have been a couple of questions that have come in, so I'm going to try and address those now since they've come in. Um, so the first question, uh, how does this compare to using um, uh, another uh, transnetics for genotype? Can you multiplex loci in a single sample submission? And is this? Um, can't quite see the rest of this question. Um, ah, sorry. Can you multiplex loci in a single sample submission, and is this a service? So 
Um, this isn't really a service. Um, you obviously, I think this example really calls that out, though, where you can multiplex loci um, together even in a single assay. So there's two separate mutations that are occurring. Both are relevant for disease, and in a single tube, you could just, you know, see um, both, distinguish both of these uh, from the wild type. So. And then another question that came in, would this be helpful in differentiating the presence or absence of a structural variant? I'd just like to show you some data in the upcoming slides that will address that question. So, great question. So, all right. So when we talk about um, insertions and deletions, uh, I'm talking about relatively small ones. In this particular case, I'm talking about the insertion of a single nucleotide uh, in the GBA gene. Uh, this is uh, responsible for uh, Gaucher disease, or it's a lysosomal storage disorder. Um, it's also been associated with Parkinson's disease. And I'm going to go ahead and blow this up again so that you can see it in uh, really nice detail. Again, you can see I'm going to go ahead and point to uh, this here. This uh, black line represents the wild type. Um, and then, of course, if you were homozygous with the mutation, uh, you can see the red. And then homozygous, uh, or heterozygous rather, uh, are represented by this blue curve. And so they're quite easy to see to distinguish with uh, one another, and you can see that you can uh, do this on a per sample basis. Now this would represent a small insertion, and now the example I'm showing you is now something that's slightly bigger. This is in the Aldo B gene, where now it's actually a four base pair of deletions um, here. And you can again see that there's a wild type curve, um, a mutation uh, at both um, alleles, and then of course the heterozygous. Um, here. And so these are both, both small and um, insertions and deletions. But I think what's really exciting about this um, that's not possible using some of the other probase technologies are now tackling very large um, uh, variations. So in Ty Sachs disease, there are mutations in the hex A gene, uh, one of which that's uh, really well annotated is the, uh, the 7.6 kilobase deletion. And in a single tube, using a single assay, you can go ahead and see the presence of that. And I'll show you here, uh, this black represents the wild type um, at both positions. And then the uh, sort of blue color here, this would represent the heterozygote. What's exciting about this is, of course, is this would represent that there is one 7.5 kilobase deletion on one um, chromosome arm, but the other is wild type. And then, of course, if you have a deletion at both copies, you would have this uh, you know, variant homozygous. And of course, um, these are very large deletions. It's very difficult to design uh, probe assays against this. And this is generally tackled by using a sequencing technology that could take you either a little bit longer to perform um, or not be uh, quite so easy to quickly um, analyze. So I've shown you a lot of the different sort of uh, targets that are available to you. So it's a very flexible technology. I didn't show you any examples. Um, of the epigenetic modifications, but you can also do design assays against those as well. So one of the benefits that I would argue for high-resolution melting, of course, is then the ability to attack these different targets and interrogate them. But there are a couple of others that I'd like to point out. One is the time to results. Um, it does, PCR runtimes do vary according to protocols, but in general, um, assays that have been designed by Canon Biomedical support two-step PCR with about 10 cycles. So that doesn't include the ramp rate. So you can imagine that very quickly you can get through in a, a less than an hour um, a, a genotype result for a particular sample. But one of the things that I think is really very nice about this is that it's really an absolute sort of analysis. It's really um, different than a lot of the other PCR-based technologies that rely strictly on clustering to make a genotype call. So this would be a typical figure that you would see in a, a genotype experiment, for instance, for hydrolysis probes, or more commonly known as Pac-Man probes. You can see that there are these clusters of the different genotypes. So uh, the genotype uh, in red would represent a, a homozygote for one particular allele. The, in the blue there would represent the uh, homozygote for the other allele, and then the heterozygotes would then be uh, shown there in the black in this sort of center cluster. And then in the uh, bottom left-hand corner is then the no template control where no DNA is added to the reaction. So when a new sample would be, then be tested, it would then fall within one of these clusters so that you would then uh, be able to call its genotype. But there are in some inherently very difficult things that can uh, occur in this. And because of this clustering, um, 
here, what you can see is that, for instance, just by changing the, for instance, the scale on an axis based off of the fluorescent signal that is captured during the PCR run, it could actually end up um, misleading you into uh, calling the wrong uh, genotype. So on the left-hand uh, figure, you can see the same clustering, and then there would be the gray dots that would represent the no template control uh, over here. And then we have this nice cluster uh, down here in the blue. And then we have this uh, sort of dark blue-black triangle that's in the uh, upper portion of the figure. And so you would immediately begin, oh, based off of the previous figure, you'd say, well, maybe that's a, a heterozygote, and it's not really with the homozygote. Um, and what you can see, though, is that if you did additional samples in the analysis, that it rescales the y-axis. And so the fluorescent signal now here has changed rather dramatically. And what you would then see is that original sort of dark blue triangle actually is very close to the rest of the cluster here. And it actually then represents a homozygote for one of the alleles, and that by the addition of more samples that you're able to then clearly distinguish the heterozygote. So, an insufficient number of samples in your experiment because of clustering could then uh, result in uh, not scaling the axis appropriately, and you could actually end up with making the wrong genotype call. Um, so you're sort of safeguarded only if you use enough um, uh, samples in your experiment. Let's look at another example, though. Um, when you're doing samples, a lot of times genotyping experiments, you do a few samples as they come into the laboratory, then you get some more, for instance, on a rolling basis. Perhaps um, you're only going to process so many at a time uh, by limitations of, for instance, the size of the plate in your instrument. And one of the challenges that presents is that you can't really combine data together. You have to do each individual experiment uh, and analyze the data within that experiment. And so what I'm showing here then are two individual experiments that have been run on different days uh, using samples that represent the homozygote, heterozygote, and uh, homozygote variant. And you can see they, in each individual experiment they cluster quite nicely. But if you were to try to combine those data sets, you then end up with uh, a really large number of different clusters that then become very, very difficult to discriminate against. And that would then require you to, you know, for instance, run <coughs> Um, a number of, you know, samples all at the same time, um, and that makes it very difficult. And this is all contrasted with, for instance, um, high-resolution melting analysis, which is, as I said before, it's really an absolute data analysis. So it, it scales whether it's a small number of samples, for instance, as small as a, a single sample, that you then look at the TM values, up to uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of samples that you could run in very, very large experiments. Because you have these very distinct peaks that then have associated melting temperatures, so you could even run controls to compare a single sample against. Um, and then once you know, for instance, the profile, uh, the melting profile for your individual variations, you could uh, very easily be able to call individual ones. So on a rolling basis, this is very scalable, but if you have a large number, uh, it's a very fast technology to be able to get through all of these samples. So I did see another question that came in. Um, for amplification of repetitive regions, how is this impacting the high-resolution melt, i.e. transposable elements or microsatellite repeats? So that's a great question. Um, there are certainly attempts at trying to deal with this because these uh, repetitive regions could then change your amplification product length, which would then change your melting temperature. Um, there are some examples of, um, that have been attempted um, and some very like, specific examples. I believe, uh, if I'm not mistaken, um, I think there's an example with um, uh, fragile X that has been attempted to be called through high resolution melting analysis that's been paired with real time PCR uh, in a paper. And I'll certainly try, uh, for those of you that are requesting the slides, I'll try to provide some footnote as to uh, what that paper would be. So, um, in summary, I think HRM assays enable you to test for a really broad range of genetic variations. Uh, they deliver very uh, fast reactions, so you get your results sooner. And the data analysis is very simple. You can do uh, just one sample at a time, or you can do very, very large sample numbers. And so Canon Biomedical uh, has generated a library of assays in chemistry focused on using high-resolution melting analysis. We call them the novo allele assays in chemistry, so new uh, allele. Um, and uh, they're available, they're compatible with uh, virtually any uh, HRM compatible uh, thermocycler. We ship our assays in master mix under environmental conditions, so there's no additional ice packs or 
things to deal with, and you can store them uh, just in the refrigerator, so you don't even have to carve out freezer space for them. If you've already designed your own HRM assays, uh, you certainly can um, use our 2x Novalil oligo deletion buffer to go ahead and dilute those uh, oligos and then use it with our rapid PCR chemistry. And we have a, a, on our website, uh, you can either browse or search for individual SNPs of interest in human biology. We have a discover section on our website that's arranged by um, human biology, so cancer, uh, uh, immune, develop, uh, immune disease, infectious disease, all of these are human variants that in some way uh, in, impact human uh, biology. Or you could search for individual variants by either uh, gene or RSID, ClinVar number. Um, you could search for the, for instance, if there's a pharmacogenetic association, you could even search by a particular drug that's associated with individual SNPs to look at what are the SNPs that impact um, their drug response. So in conclusion, um, I'm happy to introduce Canon Biomedical as your new partner um, in biomedical research. Uh, we're already doing ongoing collaborations, as I showed in the beginning of the talk, with other companies. We're interested in uh, working with universities, and we're already um, at a couple of universities sharing some of our technologies and working uh, towards advancing their research. To support human genetic research, we've launched uh, last year the Novalil assays in chemistry. So these are assays for rapid PCR that are then coupled with high resolution melting analysis. And it's an optimized chemistry that can deliver genotyping results in under an hour. We have a lot more coming out later this year. We're going to be very excited to share that with you um, as it comes out. And so with that, I'm going to go ahead and close. I'm going to leave up uh, first, the, here's the questions. Uh, I'm happy to take any additional questions that you have. Um, we have a booth here at LabRoots. We encourage you to stop by. We have additional materials there that uh, you can download. Um, and there's our email address, our website, and our phone number. We're happy to have you reach out and talk to us and see if we can help you with your experiments. And at this point, I'd like to go ahead and launch my last poll, which would be um, how many of you would like me to send you a copy of the slides. Um, and I'd be happy to do that. So if we can go ahead and launch that poll for the duration of the, the talk, I'd be ha happy to um, send you those slides. Um, uh, after today. And whatever other questions that you have about uh, the technology and how we've approached it or who Canon Biomedical is and our other interests, I'd be happy to take those questions now. So thank you very, very much. Thank you, Brian, for that informative presentation. It's time for Q&A. If you have a question you'd like to ask Brian, please do so now. Just click on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window, type your question into the box that appears on your screen, and click on the Send button. And we'll give you a few moments to do that. Maybe you're answering the poll. If there are no more questions, I would like to once again thank Brian for his presentation. Do you have any final comments you'd like to share with us today? Brian? Well, I certainly appreciate everyone's time um, today uh, listening to sort of Canon Biomedical and introducing ourselves to the biomedical research audience. Um, one of the questions that sort of I'm often uh, asked when I come uh, to different presentations uh, regarding this technology is really, um, you know, it's, uh, you know, how scalable it is. And I really wanted to spend a lot of time there on the data analysis because we do find that that is one of the things that's actually very, very easy about having uh, pre-format assays that have uh, sort of known characteristics. And so um, if you go onto our website, you can see, for instance, the melt curves that are associated with each of those different uh, relevant mutations. Um, so I encourage you to check that out. And with that, um, I think I'd like to go ahead and close. Well, thank you again, Brian. I would also like to thank our sponsor, Canon Biomedical, for making today's webcast possible. This is an educational webinar and thus offers free continuing education credits. After the webinar is over and to get your CE credits, just click on the CE button located in the bottom left-hand corner of your web page. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through November 12, 2016. You'll receive an email from LabRoots letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.